Hi, this is John Horgan. This podcast is an outgrowth of my new book, Mind Body Problems. It's about the deepest mystery of existence, the human mind. You can read the book for free online at mindbodyproblems.com. The book profiles nine thinkers exploring connections between their personal lives and theories. On the podcast, I talk to subjects of my book and other mind body experts. In this particular episode, I talk to Stuart Kaufman, one of the deepest thinkers I know. My chapter about him is called Tragedy and Telepathy. I hope you enjoy the chapter and the following conversation. Hi, Stuart Kaufman, are you there? I am here. Hey, Stu. Um, Let me just make some brief introductions here. My name is uh, John Horgan. I am a science writer, longtime contributor to uh, Blogging Heads TV and and, uh, Meaning of Life TV. Um, And uh, with me today is Stuart Kaufman, who is one of the deepest thinkers I've ever encountered. Uh, Stu, I think it's fair to call you a polymath. You're somebody who's trained in a lot of different fields, um, and you are really interested in the deepest questions. Um, How did life begin? Uh, What explains the extraordinary uh, order that we see in the universe, both biological order and non-biological order? What explains consciousness? Um, These are some of the problems that are part of uh, what I call the mind-body problem. Um, And uh, you've been dealing with these these sorts of problems for decades. I first crossed tracks with you in the early 90s when I was doing an article for Scientific American on the origin of life, and you had some fascinating ideas about, uh, about how life began um, that were sort of complementary to some of the more traditional ideas coming from evolutionary theory. And uh, then I, I've interviewed you a bunch of times. That's true, and I could talk about that, but, but uh, I think you're still on your introduction. Yes. Um, or do you want me to talk? About? Well, I just wanted to say that there's been kind of a, a, a change in our relationship. I was pretty critical of your ideas in the beginning, especially you had these very uh, grand ideas um, about the origins of, uh, of order and ideas that could possibly explain uh, really complex phenomena. I was critical of you in the end of science and um, I've changed my view of your work over the last decade, especially maybe, just a, maybe 15 just a years. Just a second. Sure. Hey, Don, I'm being recorded. Can you not do that? Oh, okay. John, there's some broken glass that's being zapped up. Okay. I, I guess they're done. Hey, this is really common on uh, this is common on blogging heads TV. Phone calls, kids running in and out of the room. That kind of stuff happens all the time. All right, so I think that's enough of an introduction. I'm just saying that I, I think we're getting along pretty well these days, considering that we were saying some pretty harsh things about each other back in the mid nineties, especially right after my book. Uh, the end of science came out and I have a whole chapter dedicated to you and mind body problems um, and your views on consciousness and uh, the mind body problem more generally. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Well, we have become friends, John, and it's very nice. I admire you too. Uh, I was very angry at you in the mid nineties. Yes. I know a lot of people were. On the other hand, I admired your capacity to skewer your own. <laughs> you skewered me very well. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, I, I sort of enjoyed that. It was fun. Um, well, you're good at it. But I wonder... Aristotle said, the exercise of a skill, you've got the skill. Yeah, if I've got a sword, I guess I'm, I'm inclined to use it. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm becoming... Uh, <laughs> nicer in my old age, but that's not for me to judge, I guess. 
Um, but Stu, I wonder if you could get things going by giving us a little bit of background. I'm just curious, I know you've got, you know, you're trained as a physician, but I'm curious how you became interested in the really big questions. Uh, did that start when you were just a little kid or did it come a little bit later? I think it came a little bit later, John. Um, my, my background is I majored in philosophy and psychology at Dartmouth and graduated in 1961. Yeah. Then I had a Marshall Scholarship to Oxford, to Magdalen College, and I, I read philosophy, psychology, and physiology, and I was going to be a philosopher. Um, I was going to be a playwright before that. I was a very bad playwright. I've actually written two plays recently. I think you know that. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do philosophy. Um, Along the way, I did uh, psychology at the time when receptor fields were being studied, neural receptor fields. So I knew, I knew I was my, Stuart Sutherland was my don, my tutor, and he asked me really tough questions like, how can vernier acuity work when the distance between the two parallel lines is the distance between two rods? And I'm very proud of my answer. I said that I must jiggle and turn it into a time signal. It's different for two lines and one line, and it turned out I was right. Uh -huh. So it turned out I was a better scientist than philosopher, although I guess I'm an okay philosopher. Um, and th then literally what happened to me is I, on my way to medical school, um, I took a course in embryology uh, at Berkeley. I did all my pre-med courses in one year. John, they had the flatworm, and you cut the flatworm in half and it regenerates. And I thought, how in the world is that conceivably possible? And at that point, the problem of cell differentiation was abundant in biology. And the Jacob and Minot fundamentally answered the problem. So here's, here was the problem in 1960. All the cells in your body have the same genes, but cells make different proteins, like red cells make hemoglobin and white cells make antibody molecules. How can you have different genes active in different cell types when they've got the same genes? And nobody knew the answer. So Jacob and Minot got the Nobel Prize for the lactose operon in 1961, they discovered it. In 1963, well, they discovered that one gene can make a protein that binds next to another gene and shuts the other gene off from making its protein, RNA and protein. So in 63, they published a seminal little paper saying, suppose you've got two genes, A and B, and A can shut off B and B can shut off A. Well, that little circuit has two steady states, A on, B off, B on, A off. So you can have the same genome, but different patterns of gene expression. And I was just thrilled. And uh, I mean, I knew how to think about neurons being on and off, so I could think about genes being on and off. It was the same kind of problem. I didn't know differential equations, but I knew Boolean logic. Within a year, I invented random Boolean nets. So I think I began by asking a big question, John. Um, I wanted the following to be true. I hoped that it would be true that there was a class of, uh, well, it was obvious that there was some sort of large genetic regulatory network in cells whose behavior had something to do with, with ontogeny from the zygote. Everybody started thinking that. I asked an unusual question. I said, is there a class of networks whose typical properties is that they behave with sufficient order to explain ontogeny? Now, that's a non-typical question, and I was 24 at the time. And how would you ask that question? Well, you need a class of systems. So I made up random Boolean nets, which can, you can have ensemble to Boolean nets, and I'll define that in a moment. And then you can study the behaviors of such networks and have our generic properties. So just in a word, a Boolean network is N light bulbs. Each light bulb has an input from K light bulbs and some Boolean rule like and, or, if, not, um, on its inputs, it do, describes its dynamical behavior given the states of its inputs. So a system like that, I guess I have to take a little bit of math, a state of the system is the current value of all and light bulbs. If the light bulbs update synchronously, the simplest assumption, then the system goes from a state to a state to a state to a state. But there's a finite number of states, so eventually it will hit a state that it's been in before. Then the system is deterministic, so it will do the same thing again. So we'll go around a cycle of states, brilliantly called a state cycle. That's the generalization of A on, B off, and B on, A off. Those are dynamical attractors. 
And it was just obvious to me that cell types were high dimensional attractors in large genetic regulatory nets. So I didn't, and I knew for, for obscure reasons that networks with two inputs were going to be magical. It, it turned out I was right. How I knew that, I have no idea. I just lucked out. It turned out years later that Boolean networks can be ordered, critical, or chaotic. Um, and K2 networks are critical if you use random Boolean functions. So you can make critical networks. And um, jumping well ahead, um, I was right about two big things. It's now clear that cell types really are alternative attractors of large scale genetic regulatory networks. That's work due to Sui Huang and me and others. Um, and the idea is now fairly common. It's the idea of multi-stability. More excitingly to me, or equally excitingly to me, it's turning out now that genetic regulatory networks are critical. They're poised between order and disorder. They're on the edge of chaos, which is a phrase from the Santa Fe Institute about when you were interviewing us, John. Yeah, I It's turning out that that idea is right. And two papers are just coming out right now. They're both just published in the last month. One showing that yeast is critical or slightly subcritical, and the other analyzes 67 genetic regulatory nets in a variety of organisms, and they're all critical or slightly supercritical or slightly subcritical. So two big ideas look like they're right. That's not bad. Let me just back up. This, they, the, um, this model that you're talking, talking about, this Boolean model, first of all, um, Boolean logic is, is something that um, is fundamental to computer programming, as I understand it. I mean, this uh, started being used back in the 1930s. I think Claude Shannon wrote a, a uh, master's paper when he was at MIT about how Boolean logic could be used for uh, programming. And now you're finding applications for it in, um, in uh, genetic networks. I I'm not sure if you were also thinking that there, it might be applicable in, in uh, networks of uh, neurons, but th the way you're talking about it, this reminds me of the kind of thinking that was common at the Santa Fe Institute in the 90s you're, you're finding a model that might apply very broadly, right? Is that the idea or is this more specialized? No, it might apply very broadly. My understanding is that there's evidence that the brain is also dynamically critical. I'm not an expert on this, John. Uh, Jack Cowan, my old chairman at the University of Chicago Department of Mathematics knows about this. John Beggs has done the experimental work with brain slices where you get avalanches of neural activity and it's a power law distribution slope minus 1.5 so it's critical the same thing is found in avalanches of gene expression changes when you delete a gene in yeast that's just what what roberto Serra has done in this yeast paper so it may apply it may apply to brains it may apply to genetic regulatory nets it may apply in another area there's i don't know much about this but there's an area called reservoir computing which I know little about, John, but it's, you take a, in effect, a Boolean net or a neural net, and you have an input layer, something like an input layer and a trainable output layer, and you're trying to train it to, to achieve something. You never monkey with the, the big network in between, the reservoir computer. My understanding is they always choose networks that are critical because they work better. Now, I don't know that to be true, but I believe it to be true. It may be that being dynamically critical is very, very useful on a very broad variety of fronts. And, and um, you can sort of see why it might be. Oh, another guy, oh, what's his name? I'll think of it in a minute. He's a, he's a computer scientist at the University of Vermont. And I'll think of his name in a moment. Anyway, he's making robots. The brains are critical Boolean networks. He can evolve the robots that do desired tasks by mutating the connections and the logics in the Boolean network. What's interesting about what this guy's doing, and gosh, why can't I think of his name? I'm, I'm sorry, whoever it is, he's in the computer science department. Um, it's not propositional. It's not, it's not um, uh, old fashioned AI has statements like, if X is greater than seven, then, then go to statement 43. Okay, that's propositional old AI. This is not that. This is just a Boolean net that's the brain of a robot 
and it's evolvable by mutating the brain of the robot. And this fellow finds that he has to make the brain of the robot dynamically critical in order to make it evolve well. I, so I, I want to also get into your the the idea that we talked about more than 20 years ago that um, this sort of idea, uh, which is a way of generating organization and order um, in lots of different systems, can be complementary to our more fundamental or our conventional understanding of biology. So you thought that this way of generating order um, could be possibly just as important as natural selection in creating life and then um, guiding life in certain directions. Is that right? It's almost like a... Yeah, that line of thought's the following. Right. Well, so that's in my first and second. Right. Visions of order and of home in the universe. Um, uh, the idea is, and Darwin would not have minded this at all. If it turns out that there's spontaneous order in complex systems, why wouldn't natural selection make use of that? And so, really the discovery is that there's spontaneous order in complex systems that we didn't know about, like Boolean nets have enormous order in them spontaneously. Why would natural selection make use of it? And apparently it has, uh, and it has in the following sense, John. Criticality is rare. Most networks are not critical in a two-dimensional parameter space of features of, neural, of, of genetic networks or neural networks called K and P, there's a two-dimensional parameter space. Criticality is a one-dimensional line in that two-dimensional space. So it's a set of measures zero. That means that something has to networks to be critical because they won't just be that way if you just make them randomly, even though I made them randomly, but I put in K2. Um, and they're working on how it could be that natural selection constructs networks that are critical. And that's a lovely story that I can tell you about if you'd like to hear it. Well, we've got so much, um, we, we haven't even gotten to consciousness, consciousness yet. So, um, right. I, I, but before we, before we get to that, I wanted to- uh, A minor topic. Yeah, I, 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 I wanted to give you the chance, if you like, to talk about this, this pretty, uh, traumatic, very traumatic event in your life that had a had a profound effect on your scientific and philosophical thinking. So this is this is the event well, I've had involving your daughter. With my daughter. Well, you wrote about it beautifully, John. Um, and I can't. I mean, I can just say it was hideous. Uh, I just Mary wonder if you can was, sort of uh, merit was yeah sorry go ahead merit i adored merit um probably merit is the person i've loved the most in my life uh and i have a, another son who i love and uh, my first wife who i love and died recently and my second wife who i love but merit was special she um the events, I could just describe the events for you again. Well, uh, Merit, over, do you want me to do that? Yeah, um, uh, as long as, I mean, maybe uh, since people can read my chapter, sort of give the, give the most um, important facts that people need to know, especially insofar as it relates to your ideas about consciousness. Okay, so I had a vision un, un, unintended vision of almost in detail how Merritt would die um, a month before she died. And I can account for being worried about her, but I can't account for the specificity of the vision. By the way, I've got a spoon that I can show you. Okay, that's, that's a different model. Um, so 
I had picked I had picked Merritt up at her boyfriend's. I didn't want her to have a boyfriend in particular at age 13, but she did. Uh, and I picked her up and she said, Daddy, I'm gonna walk home. And I thought it was three miles to the house. And it was it was mid-October. It was about now. It was now or a little bit earlier. As I picked Merritt up and drove down this the driveway and out onto the main street, I suddenly had a vision of Merritt walking down the lane that I was driving in and be struck from behind and killed by a car. Now, that's not far from how Merritt was killed a month later, and you've already written about it. I won't repeat it. But I can account for being worried about Merritt. I mean, any any parent would be worried about a daughter saying, I'm going to walk home. I can't account for that splash surge terrifying image that hit me um well i guess i need to tell you a, a couple more facts what merit did the day that she died is that she was over at alex's house alex said that he wanted to break up with merit asked to borrow money from her to take a taxi over to see his new girlfriend uh, merit may or may not have given him the money i don't know she walked out of the house she walked to the tree where I had had the vision as we drove by it. She walked across the street. She put down her purse. She walked back to the first side of the road and she laid down in the road with her head towards the center of the road and her feet towards the edge of the road, all in that lane. Facing Alex's house, I think, I, I want to imagine, so that if Alex took a taxi, He'd see her and it was a desperate plea for attention or something. I don't, I'll never know. Anyway, a car came in the opposite direction, slammed on its brakes, swerved into Merritt's lane and crushed her brain stem. No, that's how Merritt actually died, not by walking down the lane. But why would I have an image of Merritt walking down the lane? Meanwhile, um, we found some drawings that Merritt did shortly after she died that were Grateful Dead dedicated drawings that a 13 year old did that showed a girl lying in the road exactly the way Merritt was lying in the road. That was done before she died, obviously. Uh, lying halfway across the road. And, and um, this is pretty painful to talk about, John. Anyway, if you try to account for, if you grant that there's some reality to that experience that I had, then either it's telepathy that Merritt was intending in some place to do that, or that it's a prevision. A prevision knocks our notion of the flow of time, so I have a hard time with it. I have an easier idea with a telepathic connection with Merritt. Um, and then you have to ask how can you Go ahead. I'm saying this all happened in the uh, mid 1980s. Merritt died in 1986. Yeah. Uh, right. Hi, John. Hey, Catherine. How are you? Good. Good, Good timing. Ah, uh, yes. Um, you gonna go? Ahead? Yeah, I've got a uh, one of these at 4:30, so I'll be back before then. Give me a call if you think of anything. Okay. Here. Yeah, if you can find any, they don't have any spicy chai. I thought she was coming over to give you moral support. <laughs> Why is she giving moral support? Uh, so how would one account, how would one possibly account for this, John? Um, and I want to account for it by thinking that consciousness is related to quantum mechanics and that it's conceivable that telepathy is related to, to entanglement and non-locality. So do you know about those? Um, we've talked about them, but I wonder if you can help the audience out there understand those concepts, entanglement and non-locality. Well, it takes a while to get to them. So let me explain some things. I'm not a physicist, I'm a biologist. Um, I have written for some years on the idea that consciousness must have something to do with quantum mechanics, or not must, but plausibly has something to do with quantum mechanics. I think it plausibly has something to do with quantum measurement. 
Um, and part of the reason is, is or, or de a process called decoherence. And part of the answer to that and the reason for that is that it answers the causal closure of classical physics. So uh, a disquisition on the causal closure of classical physics. Newton gives us three laws of motion. Um, and then Laplace tells us that if we knew the positions and momenta of all the particles in the universe, a giant computing system in the sky could compute the entire future and the entire past of the universe. That's the birth of modern reductionism. Okay, and it says that causal, the, the rubric is that the, the, the contemporary classical physics is causally closed. Namely, uh, given the positions and momentum of all the particles, you can compute everything that's gonna happen. And you can, except for deterministic chaos, which messes it up to some extent, but that's sort of a side story. So, so then you have, let's, let's go back to Descartes, who says, I think, therefore I am. Then he says, res cogitan and res, res extensa. Res extensa is the classical extended world. Res cogitan is mind stuff. It's a substance dualism. That's really important. Already in Descartes' time, people worried, the, the, the queen or princess of, uh, of, of, of Sweden wondered, how does mind stuff act on body stuff? And nobody's ever answered that question. I'm going, I'm going to provide a, a hoped for answer for you in a couple of minutes. And I like it, John. I do really like it. Uh, and it's part of this whole story. So the, 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 the causal closure of classical physics says the following thing. There's nothing for mind to do. And there's no way for mind to do it. The current state of the brain is entirely sufficient to determine the next state of the brain. Therefore, there's nothing for mind to do. And worse, there's no way for mind to do it. So you're driven to an epiphenomenalism. Mind is just an epiphenomenon of the brain. And that's possible. Many people propose an epiphenomenalism. Does that also imply that free will doesn't exist? Yes. Right. Um, so, so the cause of closure of classical physics is no free will. Right. Right. Okay. So... Um, about eight or nine years ago, I found out about a process called decoherence. So here's decoherence. Um, how do I explain decoherence? Uh, does the audience know the two slit experience experiment? Uh, uh, if you, let's see. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I think most people are familiar with it, but can you, can you give a really uh, yeah, really once over, once over, once over lightly. You have a, a screen with two slits in it. You cover one slit, you shine a flashlight at it, and you have a film emulsion behind the slit. You get a bright spot behind the open slit. You swap which slit is open, and you get a bright spot behind the other slit. If you open both slits, you don't get two bright spots. You get a sequence of light-dark patterns called an interference pattern. And that's a two-slit experiment that contains most of the mysteries of quantum mechanics, said, said uh, Richard. It doesn't have entanglement and non-locality. We'll get to that in a minute. So th they invented a wave equation to account for this. The Schrodinger equation is a wave equation. And the easiest analogy to get to, to understand this is a water wave or a sequence of water waves approaching a seawall on the land side of the seawall, the gaps, you'll get semicircular waves propagating towards the shore, and they'll hit the beach. If the semicircular waves from the left and the right gap overlap one another on the beach, as you walk along the beach, there'll be places where the two waves' peaks coincide, and you get a higher wave. That's a bright spot. Two valleys coincide, that's a low spot, and you'll get a bright spot on the film emulsion. But in between the two, you get a place where the peak of one wave coincides with the valley of another, and they'll annihilate. They just average out to nothing. And that gives you a dark spot. So that gives you the intuition that if you have wave phenomena, you can get light-dark patterns. And that's, that's, that's a two-slit experiment and, and the core of quantum mechanics. <laughs> like I said, this is how these things go. All right, please continue. All right. All right. So I want to get to I want to get to uh, I want to try to answer Descartes 350 years later. And John, I really think that maybe I can. I mean, I'm not brave enough to say I've answered Descartes, 
but I actually think I have, but I gotta be careful with you. You'll say, you'll skewer me with it. So, so be a friend. No, no, I, that, that, that was you the post, old me. You post skewering. Now, now I want, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm welcoming of all ideas. Good, so here's an idea. So decoherence is the following. Um, the wave equation propagates waves, the Schrodinger wave equations, and the wave has phase information, whether it's up or down in the cycle. The phase information can get lost from an, a quantum system into the quantum environment. And when that happens, the interference pattern disappears. It's called decoherence. Normally it takes on the order of a femtosecond. The big thoughts here are the following that decoherence can get you to the classical world for all practical purposes. It's not quite, but it's almost the practical world. But the second thing, and I've, I've got a patent on this with a friend, is that decoherence is reversible. People don't know this, but there's a theorem by a guy named Peter Shore that says, if you inject information into a decohering, say, qubit, you can make it recohere again. So we invented the poised realm, John, which I am going to explain. Okay, there's an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis is at the origin; it's quantum. Going up the x, going up the y-axis. I meant the y-axis. Going up the y-axis is to decohere to classicality for all practical purposes. But the new thing is you can come back down. So we call this the poised realm because you can be coherent, decoherent, or recoherent again. And it's true, you can. I'm telling you something that's true. And we actually have a patent on it. Does, it's does, a crazy patent. Does this have an application? And does this apply in quantum computing? I think it does, but I'm not sure. I hope it does. Um, I think it may be a new way of making a quantum computer. Right. Um, just a word about that. Quantum computing tries to stay quantum coherent. D-Wave uses controlled decoherence to find answers to problems. What if you could make a system that can decohere and recohere and decohere and recohere over and over and over again? That's a new kind of system and nobody has made it yet. And I think that it's an exciting, exciting possibility. Now, there's meanwhile, there's an x-axis, which is order, criticality, and chaos, like for Boolean nets. It's achieved by arranging Hamiltonians in a funny order. And at, at criticality, uh, the system is just going unstable. The, the classical trajectories are just going unstable. The, the Lyapunov exponent is going positive. The quantum equivalent of criticality is called the metal insulator transition. So this turns out to be uh, poised between being an insulator and between being a conductor. And Gabor Vate is done, he's my colleague in Budapest, has done a bunch of work on this. And we have shown something quite astonishing, John. We've shown that most molecule, organic molecules are either ordered or critical. Very few of them are chaotic. Half of them are critical. Nobody knows why, including proteins. And there's a conference on protein quantum criticality in a few weeks at Arizona State University. So that means that the poised realm is real, okay? Both axes are real, so the poised realm is real. So here's what the big picture that I want to get out of it. I want to imagine a mind which is quantum that decoheres to classicality for all practical purposes, then can recohere and do it over and over and over and over and over again. But that means that the mind can have a, see, decoherence is a causal. There's nothing causal going on. That means that a quantum mind can have a causal consequences for the classical need of the brain. And that answers Descartes. Descartes, Descartes has a substance dualism and he's got to have causal consequences of mind on body, and that won't work. This try, and it's the same with measurement, um, measurement is almost certainly a causal, and it means that an a-causal quantum mind can have consequences for the classical meat of a brain. I think that may answer Descartes. So that's part of why I want to locate consciousness with quantum measurement. It's the way to answer Descartes. Can, is there any way to say what is happening at the level of consciousness or cognition when you have this process of decoherence and recoherence, or however you phrase it? Or is, or is, that, is this so fundamental that you can't say 
what's happening during these transition states. So in some desperation, I get to thinking that, that I, I've, I've chickened out. I, 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 I take the, the resource that consciousness is an aspect of the universe. And a lot of people are getting to that now. Uh, namely, this gives you, this doesn't give you what consciousness is. It gives you something about how consciousness acts. But it doesn't say what consciousness is. I think to try to, I don't know how to get to what consciousness is, John. In other words, this could be, does this imply a kind of panpsychism that consciousness is uh, something that is associated with physical processes that are probably uh, universal, that pervade the entire universe and aren't necessarily restricted to biological systems? Is that the implication? I think it might be. If you say that quantum variables can measure one another, which sometimes quantum physicists are willing to say and sometimes they're not, then so like, like uh, uh, I'll think of his name in a moment, a guy in Israel wants to think of quantum variables measuring one another. If this happens every time measurement happens, then there's consciousness in the universe. Uh, and so I think it's possible that there's a panpsychism. Um, so where does telepathy come in? How does okay, it... Okay, so I was going to... Yeah, so now I have to get, I have to get us back to non-local, entanglement and non-locality, uh, which I also think... I, I'm brave enough to think I can explain non-locality, John. That's another thing we, re- we published on it. But here, here's non-locality. Um, in quantum mechanics, and I only partially understand this, again, I'm not a physicist, You can have two quantum variables that are entangled, or you can have many quantum variables that are entangled. Roughly, that means you cannot write the system as a set of independent variables. They're all one system. So here's the dope. I've got two spin one half particles, and they're entangled. I guess they're electrons. Um, And if one is measured to be spin up, the other must be measured to be spin down. They're anti-correlated. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1933 published a paper on this, and they said quantum mechanics must be crazy. It it implies that even if the two electrons are now millions of miles apart, get this, the instant one is measured and found to be up or becomes up, instantaneously the other is down, even though they're millions of miles apart. But the theory of relativity says light can only travel at the speed of light, which is a finite velocity. There's no way that the two can be in contact with one another. Therefore, this is spooky action at a distance, said Einstein. Well, the experiments have been done by Alan Aspect and others, and the universe is non-local. Right. Okay. There's instantaneous correlations far apart, or at least faster than the speed of light spreads. Nobody understands it. If you want, I will try to tell you one possible way of accounting for non-locality. But in any case, non-locality is a fact of the universe, and it's a major puzzle in quantum mechanics. Okay, bring that back to consciousness has something to do with quantum mechanics. And I am entangled with merit. And because I'm entangled with merit, when something happens in merit, said instantaneously, something happens in my head, and I have a conscious experience, like the experience I had. There's also the dream that my friend Linny, Linda Haley had, I called Linny the day after Merritt died, and I hadn't talked to her for eight months. And Linda said, my God, Stuart, last night, she she was pulverized that Merritt had died. Then she said, last night, I had a dream that you were down in your dining room, and Liz was holding you from behind, and you were, I thought you were going to die in the dream. You were so crushed. Now, how did Linny have that dream the night that Merritt died when I hadn't been in touch with her for eight months? Okay, that looks like telepathy to me, too. Or, you know, it's just a random chance. The standard answer is it's a random chance. And we have lots of dreams that we remember the striking ones. But let's take them serious. Let me just uh, ask you for a little context. At this point in your life, had you ever had paranormal experiences before? Were were you interested in the paranormal? Um, Did you find some of the claims uh, credible? So what was your intellectual state of mind before you had these these anomalous experiences? I knew the Ryan experiments and I knew they'd been pretty much discredited. 
These are experiments Irish. done at Duke uh, by, uh, no. by, by a psychologist well, yeah. back in the 30s, I think, that were taken very seriously by lots of scientists. Until they couldn't, yeah. be, then they, they were not really uh, replicated. Replic yeah. Yeah, so my attitude towards it was highly skeptical. Right. Uh, and it stays skeptical. I mean, I don't know that the experience that I had for merit, you know, wasn't just a, a brain plug. I know that I was terrified when it happened. And I know that Linda had the dream that she had the night that Merritt died and I hadn't been in touch with her for eight months. So I don't know how come Linny had that dream. Yeah. That's, that's, that's remarkable. And she pictured me exactly where I was. I was seated in the dining room, crushed with my wife's arms around me, trying to cope with what had just happened. Um, okay, so non-locality is a way of trying to get telepathy to happen. And also you see, entanglement is very fragile. It, it's broken apart very easily, which would say that it's an evanescent phenomenon, which isn't nice scientifically. One wants a stable phenomenon, but if entanglement is in, is 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 evanescent, that could explain why telepathy is hard to repeat. Right. Do I know that that's true? Of course, I don't know that it's true. I but I tend to think that it's plausible. I can't account for my experiences. Um. So. I forget if we discussed this, but uh, you probably know that Freeman Dyson, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, um, finds, I'm not sure if, he, if it's fair to call him a believer in, in the paranormal, but um, he takes it seriously, thinks it could be true. And he thinks that the reason that it can't be replicated or, or demonstrated in a laboratory is because it usually happens to people who are under some kind of severe emotional stress. So I wonder if you find that, and that certainly applies in your case. And I wonder if you find, uh, find that uh, hypothesis credible. I find it credible that it applies to people in, in severe stress. Um, I don't know why that would be related to entanglement or anything else. But right. That that seems a stretch to me. John, would you like to hear uh, an account for non-locality? Sure. It's around four or five minutes. Um, okay. Um, I published a paper recently called Taking Heisenberg's Potentia Seriously with Ruth Kastner and Michael Epperson. The three of us came across, I didn't know, I didn't know Heisenberg's idea when I came to it. I, I can tell you how I came to what I'm going to tell you. Um, again, I like it. Um, I'm not persuaded that it's right, but it, it does seem to explain non-locality and some other mysteries of quantum mechanics, certainly non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, Heisenberg, in 1958, Heisenberg, a name everybody knows, proposed that, that quantum, quantum phenomena aren't actuals, they're potentia. They're possibles. He got that from Aristotle, who talked about potential. Um, I got to it in a different way, and then I found out about Heisenberg, who beat me by 60 years, so fair enough, and he's a great physicist and I'm not. Um, in, in, the, in the superposition case, you can say of the electron that it's simultaneously spin up and spin down. That gets translated into a mystery by Schrodinger, the Schrodinger cat mystery uh, or conundrum, that the cat is simultaneously alive and dead until it's measured. That's like the spin is simultaneously up and down until it's measured. And it is. In quantum mechanics, it's simultaneously up and down. That's a statement about quantum mechanics. It's correct. So uh, that's called a superposition state, and it's standard in, in quantum mechanics, non-relativistic and relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, how can that be true? And I got into it in the following way. Um, a philosopher named C.S. Peirce said, actuals will be Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. The cat is on the matter, the cat's not on the mat. There's nothing in the middle. 
He said, possibles do not obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. And that's correct, so let's watch it. It's possible that the cat is on the mat, and it's possible that the cat is not on the mat. That's not a contradiction. Whereas the cat is on the mat, and the cat's not on the mat is a contradiction, right? Right. So if you put possibles in, it's not a contradiction. John, I just jumped, this is about eight years ago, I just jumped and said, let it be the case that the, 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 the world consists in possibles and actuals, ontologically real possibles and ontologically real actuals, raise potentia and raise extentia. And, uh, and then I, I knew that Whitehead had dealt, dealt with potentia also, that's what I knew. About two years later, I found out about Heisenberg thinking about potentia. What Heisenberg did not do with his potential is try to explain non-locality. So I'm going to try to explain four mysteries of quantum mechanics with the idea of raised potential and raised extension. But first I have to tell you a little. Let me just interject that, that I remember we talked about this. And by the way, if there are people who are watching this who are maybe having a hard time with some of the technical details, we do talk about many of these ideas in um, in this chapter that I, I wrote about you for my new book. And uh, I tried to explain them for myself in a, in a way that I could understand. And so um, that might help some people follow uh, our conversation. But I remember when you were talking about raised potentia, I, it seemed to me that you're talking about a whole new way of looking at causality. Yes. So it's not as though, you know, you have a certain set of circumstances and you know the laws that um, are at play on that system. And then you predict everything that will happen as, as a result of those laws within that system. It, it, it unfolds in a very straightforward way. You're talking about a different kind of causality, which is much less predictable. Is that right? Yeah. And it's almost more of, it's almost a more of a creative kind of process than you have in conventional physics. Let me give it the name that I've given it. It's called enablement to make possible. Okay. Uh, I think that. So let me, by by way of getting into this, let me tell you. Uh, this isn't a story, but let me just set this up. Suppose that you and I tomorrow are going to meet at downtown subscription. Uh, for coffee and lunch, all right? And today, a sign goes up on downtown subscription and it says, at noon today, downtown subscription is closed forever. And at noon, downtown subscription closes and the door is shuttered and they empty out the store. What just happened to the possibility that you and I could meet there tomorrow for lunch? It vanished, right? Yeah. Did it vanish? It did, it vanished. Did it vanish the instant the store was closed? Yeah. Did anything causal happen other than the store closing such that the possibilities vanished? No. Possibilities, so, so this, this means something really important. When an actuality changes, the store closes, it changes what's possible. It does so and can do so instantaneously and not causally it makes it impossible for us to meet. If another downtown subscription opened up across town, it would become possible for us to meet there, okay? It would be an enablement, it's a making possible. Okay, now with that in mind, on raised potential, raised extension, what's waving in the Schrodinger equation, nobody knows what's waving, are possibilities. They're, they're Heisenberg's potential, okay? Now, I want to use that, and I, I want to explain four mysteries of quantum mechanics. Here's the first. If I've got two or ten entangled particles, and I measure one, and it says spin up, instantaneously, the wave function for the remaining n minus one particles changes. That's straight quantum mechanics. John, if it's instantaneous, it can't be causal. But I can explain it with what we just said. When the spin is measured and it's up, that's a new actual. It obeys Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. It's up, not down. An actual obeys Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. But that changes what's possible instantaneously.
DNA causally, the wave function is our possibles, so it changes the wave function. So I've just explained that mystery in quantum mechanics. Now let me get to non-locality. I, I really like this a lot. So I'm gonna ask a preliminary question. Where's the possibility you'll fall on your head in the next hour? I mean, is it under the refrigerator? That sounds nuts, right? And the possibility, it's, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem like the possibility that you'll fall on your head is located in, in, in space or maybe in space time. So we're gonna try some ideas. Let's try one idea. Possibilities are located everywhere, poss everywhere in space simultaneously. This, this will work, but it doesn't fit special relativity, but it'll work. Or possibilities are not even in space time. You need to know that some physicists are working hard saying that space time is not fundamental. They're trying to derive it from something else. So this is inherently too nuts. Okay, let's just try possibilities are located everywhere in space. Now I've got the two, I've got the two electrons spin up and spin down. If one is measured before either is measured, it's possible that spin one will be up or spin one will be down. And it's also possible that spin two will be up and spin two will be down. But if one is found to be up, two will be found to be down. Before measurement, those are the possibilities. If you okay? Yes. If spin one is measured and found to be down, the possibility throughout the entire universe that the second particle can be found to be down just vanished, just like the, the store, our, our meeting there. That possibility vanished. So there's only one possibility left, it's up. That explains non-locality by saying that possibilities are located everywhere in space uh, and in time. So I like it. Um, and I think it works. You can also get there by saying that possibilities are not located in space-time. And we do that in this article with Ruth Kastner and Michael Epperson. And that may be better. Cause... Let me just, I, I just wanted to ask yeah. you, you know, there, there are all these new books on, uh, on quantum mechanics out on, on various interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of interest in, in Bohm's interpretation. Of course, you've still got the, the Copenhagen interpretation out there. There's the, uh, the many worlds uh, or many histories interpretation, whatever you want to call it, from uh, Hugh Everett. Um, is, is this, is your view similar to any of the ones that are already out there, or is it something entirely novel? I think it's novel, and I think Heisenberg was there in 1958. He abandoned it about six months and went back to Copenhagen. Yeah. And he certainly never applied it to non-locality because uh, non-locality, the issue of non-locality was known from Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 33, but there's no experimental evidence in favor of it. That came up in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Now we're stunned by non-locality, and uh, I think this explains non-locality. The simultaneity conditions under, under what, which I've said makes it fit only non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Ruth Kastner is persuaded that this fits relativistic quantum mechanics as well. Uh, if you go outside of space-time, and I can't speak to that, but she can. The title of the paper is Taking Heisenberg's Potential Seriously. Uh, you know, before, uh, so I, I, I know that, I mean, I'm sure you've got, there, there are more details you can offer on this. I want to sort of talk about the, the philosophical implications of your, your view. So uh, this was inspired by this horrible thing that happened to you to you and your family uh, decades ago. And um, I'm curious about, one of the things that I explore in, uh, in my book is the connection between people's private emotional experiences, some of which can be joyful, many of which are traumatic and really painful. The connection between that and their intellectual views. And so I guess my question is whether this view of yours, which really has very profound implications about the nature of reality, the nature of causation, about the relationship of the present to the future and to the past, whether it that provides any kind of consolation to you or whether it is what has been called in the past, whether it helps to re-enchant nature, which supposedly was... Um, 
leached of all its magic and mystery by the rise of classical materialistic uh, science and actually continuing right into the 20th century. Right. Um, so are there, are there sort of philosophical or, or spiritual implications of your view that um, are important to you, that are one of the reasons why you, you like this way of looking at reality? I think so. Um, nothing takes away the hurt of Meredith dying and my wife Liz is dying. N right. Nothing. That's just, that's just grief. Um, and it's ongoing grief and loss and living with it and bearing up under it and getting on with it. There's, there's no shortcut to grief. It's, it's part of life. Um, but I do think that there is a re-enchantment uh, possible. Um, and that's in my book, Reinventing the Sacred. Um, and in my, my later books too, John, in which, uh, do you know the screwdriver argument? No. Can I hit you with it? Sure. Okay. It's the quickest way you do this. I'm about to tell you that Newton, Newton gives you a world where everything is entailed by Newton's laws, uh, according to Laplace. Modulo deterministic chaos, according to Poincaré. I'm going to try to tell you that there is no law whatsoever for the evolution of the biosphere. It's a free creation. And that's magic. It's God enough for me. And that's the enchantment. Mm -hmm. So it begins with the screwdriver argument, strangely enough, this little argument that I found some years ago with Giuseppe Longo, a mathematician that they called Normal Superior. So, John, here's a screwdriver. Here, I'm handing it to you. And you're right there in wherever you are, more or less in New York. Tell me all the things you can do with a screwdriver in, 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 in Hoboken or wherever you are um, today. I can use it to scratch the itch on my back. I can use it to uh, take the uh, the cover off some of the plugs in my uh, in my apartment um, to pry the lid off uh, a tin can. Right, lots of things. So let me give you some things. Let's see if we agree. So you can use it to scratch yourself. You can use it to pick your nose. You can use it to screw in a screw. You can use it to open a can of paint. You can use it to wedge open a door, wedge your door closed. You can tie it to a stick and spare a fish. You can run out the sphere and take 5% of the catch. You just buy, right, a lot. Right. Will you buy the following? The number of uses of a screwdriver is indefinite. Sure. Okay. It changes everything. Everybody agrees. It's very strange. We all agree with this. The next thing is to remind you of scales. There are nominal scales, just the names of things. Then there's an, uh, an ordering relationship. X is greater than Y and Y is greater than Z, which gives you a partial ordering because X is greater than Z. It's a transitive relationship. There's an interval scale like a thermometer, but zero doesn't mean anything. Then there's a ratio scale like, like the ratios of two meter sticks, where two meters is twice one meter. Those are the four kinds of scales. What kind of a scale are used as a screwdriver? And there, it's, just a, it's just a nominal scale. Is a bunch of different uses. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Claim. I think this may be a theorem. There's no algorithm. There's no rule following procedure that can compute all the uses of a screwdriver or compute the next new use of a screwdriver. I think that's right. Okay. Okay. Now, that means there's something going on that's not algorithmic. By the way, you're kind of in the dark. If you could light yourself up, that'd be nice. Oh, I've, I'm backlit. Uh, because the sunlight is suddenly pouring in my window. Is that a little better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's all that has to happen in evolution, John. Um, some bacteria in some funny environment. Mm -hmm. A molecular screwdriver finds a use that enhances the fitness of the bacterium in that environment. And if there's heritable variation in natural selection, you'll probably be selected. This, this reminds me a little bit of um, the spandrel concept in... Uh, a little bit. In yeah, it's a little bit like spandrels. Yeah, it's a little like spandrels. 
Um, well, but we could not have said ahead of time what that new use is. That's another argument. But that new use is a new function. It's a new function of the screwdriver, right? Yeah. So these are Darwinian pre-adaptations. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, well, that not that similar to, um, again, in the same ballpark as the uh, concept of Gould and Lewontin? Yeah, it is a little like Darwinian pre-adaptations are a little more pointed than spandrels. So here's a Darwinian pre-adaptation. Some fish have a, a, a swim bladder. It's a sac partially filled with air and water, the ratio of which tunes neutral buoyancy in the water column. Mm -hmm. Paleontologists think that they evolved from the lungs of lungfish. So some water got into some lungs and now it's poised to become a swim bladder. So a bunch of things come up now. Do you think you could have said ahead of time that a swim bladder was going to evolve? No. Right. Could you name the pre-adaptations that are going to happen in human beings in the next four million years? No, you can't name them, okay? Um, furthermore, uh, once there's a, a swim bladder, could a bacterium come to evolve to live only in swim bladders? Well, sure, right? So the swim bladder is a new actual that affords a new adjacent possible. It enables an adjacent possible, John, Mm -hmm. But we can't say what it is. We can't say what this adjacent possible is. So the next thing is, do you think that selection acted to make a functioning swim bladder? Sure. Do you think selection acted such that the swim bladder could constitute an adjacent possible empty niche that a bacterium could evolve into? No. That means that evolution is building its own possibilities of what it will become without selection achieving it. That just blows me away. So is the evolving biosphere, building its opportunities for what it will become with nobody, with nobody in charge of it. The, the, the economy is building new niches for new apps all over the place. And, and who knows what that will become. But that means that, that means that, and here's the formal way of saying it, in physics you can always pre-state the phase space of the system, the positions and the momenta of the particles. In biology, functions are part of the phase space of evolution, but you cannot, by the screwdriver argument, pre-state them. You can't, it's not that you can't predict them, you can't even say them. You don't even know what the possibilities are. That means we can write no laws of motion for the evolving biosphere and what it will become. That means we can't integrate those laws of motion. That means there's no laws that entail the becoming of the biosphere. The biosphere is a free creation. And that is the sense of God. It's a sense of re-enchantment to me. Well, it's, it means that the future is unpredictable. Uh, the evolution from here on in, it, you know, we can make sense of evolution looking back, but we can't make sense of it looking forward. Looking forward. Why is that necessarily, why should that make us feel good? Why shouldn't that be terrifying? Because we don't know which way things are going to go. I think you could say that. I mean, that is to say, there is an, there's an extreme creativity in the biosphere. Yeah. Whether it's for what we will find valuable or not, we don't know. But there is a membership in the, in the extreme creativity that we have, whether we like it or not. You, you uh, so one of, the, one of your books is, how do, how, do, how do I know it won't be bad? I don't know that it won't be bad. Well, it seems to me that the, you know, we invented God, we invented religion to give ourselves a sense that something or somebody knows what's going on and um, right. is in control because we feel as though we are not in control of our own lives and life seems terrifyingly random. And so... Um, in a way, it seems as though your view is emphasizing the mystery of things, um, but it is, it, it is not, certainly not giving us a sense of control or that either we or anything is in control. So it might, it, it might evoke awe in us, uh, but it could easily be awe that is shading into terror you know, if we're trying to see into the distant future. You, you, you're, you're making me face 
a fact. It, what you're saying is correct. Uh, it, it evokes awe. It evokes membership. Um, we do have some choice in it. It seems to be like for in human society, yeah. we, 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 we can despoil the planet or we could try not to despoil the planet. Uh, that's, that's a choice that we can make. So I always, I always, you, you're right. I don't, I don't hearken upon the dark side of what the creativity can be. Let, let me ask you this. I, you know, we're all, we've been talking for about an hour now, so I'm, I'm looking for, I'm trying to think about how we can, um, close this sucker. How can we r- wrap this up? Uh, I, I'm curious to know whether you are, how are you feeling about life in general, about humanity, you know, where it's going? Are you, do you consider yourself an optimistic person? And, and is your optimism tied in any way to your scientific views and your philosophical views? Gosh, uh, I'm a slightly left of center Democrat. Um, I'm moderately liberal. Uh, I guess I'm both optimist and pessimist. John, I think that we are in dangerous times. There is a dark mood in the country and settling over Europe as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It may be. It may be that. It may be that it has to do with the following. There, there's a something I lived through that was very meaningful to me when I was 52. I went to a little meeting of the Gihan Foundation on the future, you know, the great problems confronting humanity, as if anybody in foursome could actually do anything about it. There was a willing suspension of disbelief, and, and Scott Mamaday said the most important problem confronting mankind is to reinvent the sacred. And my immediate response as a Jewish fruit fly genetic was to say, you can't say that. And 15 seconds later, I thought, he's right. All I know is that I was convinced that he was right. I later wrote a book called Reinventing the Sacred, and I told the Scott story, because that's where it comes from. We got to the following, John, and help me see what you think about this too. What we said was, we're entering into the early stages of a global civilization. There are going to be civilizational conflicts as our 40 civilizations weave together. But the enormous opportunities that are before us are so staggering that it may outweigh the conflicts and that we need a transnational mythic structure to undergird the emerging global civilization. And we need a global ethic. Not that we ever got there, John. The optimist in me says that we can find that. And, and I'm wondering whether or not the darkness that is upon us with, with Mr. Trump and the head of Hungary and the move to the right in, in much of Europe, including Italy, even in, even in Scandinavia, which is f- fearful of immigrants and immigrants that won't integrate and, and all of that, isn't part of shades of the cultural shocks that come as our civilizations do wing together in some way that we can't see. And whether or not we can't find a way to ask what can we create together? What can 7 billion people of our diverse civilizational backgrounds do with one another that might be magnificent? Yeah. And I find that an enthralling vision. And maybe it's just a vision, maybe it's pie-eyed, and, and you know, probably it's pie-eyed, but you know what? The Declaration of Independence is a, is a vision also. I I agree with I, I am sort of temperamentally emotionally maybe genetically predisposed to uh, optimism, but if if I if I have an ideology, it's a commitment to freedom of some kind, and I see human progress as um, this process in which we have given ourselves more and more choices in in which in, in how to live our lives. We have more opportunities yeah. to explore different ways of being. Uh, human of being a man of being a woman of being things in between a man and a woman and but the paradox of freedom is that we are free to go in bad directions Uh, 
So I'm hoping that somehow as we evolve, we keep giving ourselves more choices. And I'm, I'm actually worried that in desperation, there might be a mass commitment to one vision of humanity. Yeah. That's what most religions had in mind. That's what fascism was about. It's what totalitarian communism was about. And those were disastrous. So I guess the reason I'm, you know, I'm an old fashioned liberal, because that means everybody gets to figure this out for themselves, for himself, for herself. Um, and, um, and we, you know, I've got my own way of looking at the world and my own way of trying to have a, a good life. And there are other people who have very different ideas about what constitutes a good, meaningful life. And, you know, power to them, as long as they don't try to uh, infringe on my freedom. So that, to me, is the key question, is whether we can sustain this vision of kind of mutual tolerance and growing freedom and choice, or whether we're going to revert to some monomaniacal mono vision that I think would be in some ways the end of civilization and the end of human progress. And the, 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 I agree. And the, the danger in the darkness that is around us, it's a fear. Uh, it's a fear. It's people who've been left out of the economic flowering. It's people who are afraid of losing say the straightforward white american way of of 1948 uh it's in the united states it's 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 fear the question is can we find opportunities faster than we find fear but right. I, I agree I, I think this is a, a dark time yeah but i i i do too but maybe because i'm not i'm trying to avoid reading uh reading about all the shit that's going down in washington i'm um I'm still pretty hopeful. And, you know, I just taught, uh, taught one of my classes today. When I meet young people, that makes me hopeful. When I talk to my children who are in their mid twenties, that makes me hopeful. I think because I, I have no choice but to be hopeful. I, you know, I've got to believe that, that young people are going to have lives at least as good as, as ours were, and that they're going to continue to give themselves choices. They're going to overcome climate change and, and get past this sort of whatever you want to call it, uh, this swing to the right that's erupting in various places around the world and this fascination with authoritarian rulers. So I'm still, yeah, this, this is emotional, not necessarily rational. I still think that things are going to work out. That in maybe, that, you know, that, that maybe this is, uh, this is a, an area where the enablement, the, the potentialities, the possibilities that you're talking about are going to take us in a, keep taking us in a good direction. They can. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Let's hope. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stu, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, let's stay in touch. Okay. Just, uh, uh, all right. I just stopped recording, but now Stu is showing me something um, that I'm hoping the audience out there will find interesting. So, okay, take it away, uh, Stu. Yeah. So this is a true story. This is a bent spoon from the Esalen Institute. I did not bend this spoon, but a friend of mine thinks I bent this spoon. I bent a spoon about half as far this spoon wraps around twice. I think you can see it. And if you, if you, I can't see it. it. Hold it up a little bit more. Can you see it? Yeah, now I can see it. Yeah, so here you can see various yeah, views of it. Yeah, hold it up a little bit next to your head and back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Make of it what you will. Richard Baker Roshi bent this spoon, I'm quite certain, mm -hmm. at and it made its way to David Deemer's office. He's at the University of California, Santa Cruz. David thought it was my spoon. David gave it to me, but I know that I only bent my spoon around 180 degrees. Okay. Richard's much better because he's a, uh, he's a Roshi. So 
uh, if you take it and you try to sprung it, you can't. I mean, I can, I can, I could maybe do it a little bit, but not much. I don't find it possible to explain that, except it's psychokinesis. Yeah. I, well, I've got that picture of you in my chapter holding up, I think it's that very spoon. Holds uh, that spoon. I don't, I don't have a whole bunch of bent spoons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember after that happened, I've actually got a bent spoon over here in my draw, drawer because um, after, after you, you showed me that spoon or told me the story when we met in Tucson, I, I was, you know, I, I'm, I gotta admit, I'm totally skeptical, but I thought I'm just gonna see what it would take to bend one of my Ikea spoons. And, um, and it was actually pretty difficult, but I, I sort of bent it in half. And I regret it now because now the spoon has a kink in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I remember what I experienced. The spoon got soft. I bent it. It was pliable. Then it got firm again, and I didn't press it hard. And that's what I experienced. And you can make of it what you want. I'm yeah. not fibbing. All right. Okay, John. It's a wild world. Okay. Thanks again, Stu. I'm, I'm going to shut this down now. Okay. Talk to you soon.